Right. Um, yes. Good. We'll right. Um, Harry, good afternoon. Could you afternoon. tell us your name, your name at birth was? Yes. As My now? name at birth was Emmanuel Henry Hazel. Okay. Right. And you were born where and when? I was born in London in the January 1911. And where? Oh, in London, yes. In London. Whereabouts in, were you In Kentish Town, within the sound of bow bells on a very quiet night. I can be a cockney, almost. What were your, something about your parents? Yes. Now, my mother was the 13th child of Emmanuel Harris, who was the founder of Harrison's son, the stonemason in Whitechapel. That's, that's, that's the stonemason in Whitechapel, who, uh, who a lot of people know of, but being the 13th child, she was uh, uh, the youngest child of that family. And uh, she, when she, before she married my father, she worked for her father in his office. She did. She used to tell me a lot about what went on at the stonemason's yard and various stories. Uh, her father was as far as I can gather, and I only remember him very vaguely. I can remember seeing him as a very small child when I was about three. And he was in bed, he suffered from asthma. He was a nice old boy, as far as I can recollect. But my father told me he was warden, which is equivalent of chairman of the council, isn't it, in the North Star Synagogue. He was warden of his synagogue in white wherever he, he they lived in a big square off the white chapel road you know they're very big squares there i think quite a large house if they got 13 children they didn't need to be large although it spread over a 20 i think the difference in age between my mother and our eldest brother was about 20 years the long gap between the oldest and the youngest my mother uh got to know my father, who wasn't Jewish, because she belonged, now how this happened I wouldn't know, but she belonged to a, a social club in the Camden Road, which is in Holloway, which is quite away from Whitechapel, so I don't know how she got there, how it happened, where most of the members were Jewish. But my father, for reasons we never found out, used to go there. And in fact, by an extraordinary coincidence, used to dance with Bill's mother long before she married. And in fact, Bill's mother and my father won a cake for the cake, best cakewalk, which was at one of the dances of the days. Uh, but my father and my mother married in 1909. And um, as I said, I was named Emmanuel Henry Hazel. And I really can't tell you how, all I know is that uh, my mother, after my birth, when I was about three years old, had a mental breakdown. So she went into a mental hospital, Bethlehem actually, Bethlehem today. And she was there from when I was three till I was about eight or nine, I should think, about seven or eight years. And uh, my father moved from where he lived, we lived in Kentish Town, to Highgate. He wanted a phone tink. And uh, we lived in Highgate, my father and I. Near my father, my mother's eldest sister, who was married to Demeter. You've heard of the Demeters? I mother's oh. mother. So in other words, I share cousins with Bill, because the Demesa, the, Demesa, the cousin of the children of my mother's eldest sister, were cousins of Bill's mother. Not cousins of Bill, but cousins of Bill's mother. So I shared cousins with Bill's mother. Right. Who looked after you then in your mother, while your mother was in Well, my father got a housekeeper in to look after me. Uh, until I was six years. Then my father was uh, called up 
under the Derby scheme in the First War into the army. And for a fairly short time, I went to live with my father's parents. By that time, my mother's parents had died. My father's parents, as far as I can know, I've heard, were anti-Semitic. So it wasn't too easy. <laughs> and um, they, they had a summer home in Hearn Bay in Kent. And by the time I was about four or five, my grandfather had retired and my father was running his business, yeah. which was a uh, business concerning the uh, uh, sale of dolls which were dressed in various costumes by the workroom, my father's factory. It was a well-established firm which my father's, my grandfather started in the uh, 1880s, I should imagine. He was originally a jeweler and uh, he, I think, was in, he was in, apprenticed to a jeweler. While he was a young apprentice, he saw the last public execution in London in 1865 when three convicts were hanged in Newgate. And you remember your grandfather as... Well, my, when my father died, I found a cutting about this, which my grandfather wrote on the top. I saw these, hand, these pirates hanged. I remember him telling me about it. Anyway, well, he... Was this business fairly young? Satisfactory? Well, it, what happened was that my grandmother was very clever with her needle and a very person who regarded reading books as a waste of time. You've got to do things. This is my Anglicide, my English grandmother, not my Jewish grandmother. My Jewish well, grandmother by this time is dead. I don't remember her at all. Um, and uh, she used to she dressed dolls for her two daughters. She had two daughters and a son. She dressed dolls for my two daughters very cleverly. And uh, my grandfather was rather taken with them. So he took some of the dolls with him, with his samples, when he went out selling jewellery. And he sold them. So he came back and I told my grandmother to make some more. And uh, this grew until in the end they had a, f a business. The, the jewellery side just disappeared and uh, he built up a very good business. And by the time, time I was about four years old, I suppose, or three, my grandfather had retired. My father had taken over the business. And then when my father had to go into the army, my grandfather came out of retirement and ran the business until my father came back from the army in 1919. Was there many employees? Then there was or a factory doing this? Yes, it was a factory. It was a, at its height, I suppose it employed about 30 or 40, all women. And in Kentish Town, it was known as a convalescent home because the other big employers in the district were much harsher than my grandparents. So they had to work much harder and much severer discipline, but they got more money. And then when they, they wanted to a rest from the harsh they say to come to work for my grandfather but they got less money but got a pleasanter time so you were uh, by the way, how about your siblings Did you had none your siblings? i was an only child and i was sent down to herne bay and put in a boarding school at the age of six and also at that time whipped into church and christened henry emmanuel so i've been henry emmanuel hazel ever since then, even though my birth certificate says Emmanuel Henry. And the only person that calls me Emmanuel Henry, and he never he just addresses my letters to me, E. H. Hazel instead of H. E., is my solicitor. Um, this, when you're, you had this mixed marriage, your father being non-Jewish, yes, right. how would, did your, your mother's family, um, who were Orthodox Jewish, how did they They were Orthodox this? Jews, but they were so there was an extraordinary non, they were so untypical of the Jewish community. They were not a family like Bill's Demisa family, which all knew each other. Although there were 13 Harris children, they just uh, disintegrated all over. And uh, I knew two of mothers, one brother and one sister, uh, 
who the sister was a widow and the brother was a, a bachelor. But the others had died or moved around and I've met some cousins. One cousin was a, a high executive in the BBC and the family that one of the strange things that I presume is happens in a lot of Jewish families that when my grandfather died he left the entire business to his eldest son. So the other sons, I don't know what they inherited, if anything, but I know my grandfather, my uncle, my uncle uh, Henry Harris, who was well known at Brighton, Sonia knew him well, Sonia Dennis, Sonia Elkin, whom uh, people like uh, Alan Lewis will remember, Sonia Elkin, she was one of the founder members of the synagogue. She knew my cousin and my uncle Henry Harris, who was very prosperous and ran the business that my grandfather had founded. And it's still going, but it's changed its name. It's still Harris, but it, I think it's B. Harris now. I saw an advertisement the other day. Anyway, I went to Hern Bay as a child, and I was sent, I had to attend church every Sunday. How did you think of yourself as Jewish or Christian? Christian. Or Christian. Christian Jew. I, my, my mother didn't make any attempt to teach me anything about Judaism or any of the Jewish life. Even. She told me, used to tell me ep episodes of her early life about her, uh, my grandfather re uh, blessing the wine on Shabbat and her brothers used to, they were a, a, an extraordinary family, the Harris family, well known among my, uh, the older generation as being a, a family of very erratic and uh, peculiar people. I mean, Bill can tell you a bit more about what people think of them than I can, but I literally knew nothing of them other than I knew my Aunt Miriam and you obviously you didn't know what it meant to be Jewish. Nothing at all. In fact, I was brought up by my grandparents in Hearn Bay at the boarding school. And I went to church every Sunday, and uh, it was a very low church. You, uh, you that, accepted that? Well, that's as far as I was, I was a school child. I was only uh, between the age of six and eleven. At the age of eleven. Uh, by that time, my father had come back from the war, and my mother had come out of hospital. My mother was very concerned that I should have a good education and persuaded my father to put my name down for Highgate School, where I went at the age of 11. And at Highgate School, I was brought up, together with all the other boys, in very much a Church of England school, although there were Jewish boys in the school. And something in my makeup happened that uh, there was anti-Semitism anti at the school against a few Jewish boys there were. And I remember one, Yuskar, Edgar Leskar, you know, the, well, he was in my house at school and he was very much uh, bullied and maltreated and I didn't like what was done to him. Uh, why I did that, it was sort of instinctive, you see, in my Jewish side coming out. But at most, I mean, in the normal way, I went to, went to chapel every morning, morning service every morning, prayers in the house before, every morning when we got it before breakfast, and prayers at night after evening meal. No, at the end of the day, that's right. So we had chapel, had two lots of prayers every day, I'd had uh, church services every Sunday. I had a weekly board at Highgate, so I didn't go to chapel on the Sunday, but I was well and truly instilled in the Christian faith. But I never had any Christian, any feeling for the Christian religion. Were you confirmed? Then? No, my mother wouldn't let me be confirmed. That was the only thing she drew the line at. <laughs> she wouldn't let me be confirmed. So but I left school. Yes, how old were you then? I was 18 when I left school. What happened to you then? I was articled to a firm of chartered accountants. I had five years articles. Uh, in London? In London. And then I got a job as chief accountant to firm making hearing aids called Amplifox, 
which is well known now. And those days it had just started up, uh, and the war broke out. And uh, in those days, hearing aids had quite large batteries, and they were about half the size of half this tech recorder. And uh, when war broke out, the supply of batteries completely dried up because the general team was needed for munitions or something that they used battery. And uh, the business just stopped dead. And uh, I thought, well, what the hell, what do I do? Now, even though I was a Christian, I'd been reading about the treatment of the Jews by him. And I was very, again, Hitler and the fascists. I didn't worry much about Mussolini, but I'd become very disenchanted with Chamberlain and his government, especially over their treatment, their behavior at the time of the Abyssinian War, was the hypocrisy of imposing sanctions on the Italians without cutting off their oil, uh, which, which showed that they really didn't mean sanctions because cut off their oil would have stopped them in their tracks, but they didn't do it. So and in fact, it was Anthony Eden, of course, I don't think it was Anthony Eden, it was, but it was one of the members of the cabinet who said that those sanctions were midsummer madness. So this affected your decisions my, It about affected my views very much against the conservative government of the day, who were appeasers, and when the Russians offered a non-aggression pact before the First World, before the Second World War, because they were the Russians and communists, they sent a junior member of the Foreign Office, not a minister, to negotiate a non-aggression pact, and it died. They didn't want one, and I got very fed up. I, I wanted to join in the fight against him. I didn't know what was going to happen, so I joined the army in September 39. Just before war? No, as Just war broke out, I joined on the 12th of September, nine days after the war started. And uh, I uh, was sent to a headquarters of a territorial division, which was training in the southern home counties, it was the Home Counties Division of the East Kents, and the Buffs, the Royal West Kents, and the Queen's Royal Regiment. Those are the three artillery regiments. And we were training to go over to France, and the French, that's sick, yes. And uh, it was discovered, it was discovered that they were short of people to man the lines of communication in France, so in about January or February 1940, we went over to France, but we weren't... So you're saying, uh, well, just to repeat that, yes. you were... Uh, I, the, the, the troops that I went over with were not, they were infantrymen, but they weren't trained sufficiently to be fighting troops, and in fact at that time it was called the Phony War, and there wasn't any fighting. When the fighting started in May 1940, we were in the line of communication behind the BEF, British Expeditionary Force. Some of our infantry brigade were sent up to join with the BEF, but the Germans got between them. And uh, I came out of France long after Dunkirk from Cherbourg in June 1940, came back to England and was sent to an RASC OPTU to get a commission in the service corps, but I was deaf. I managed to get into the army because in the medical examination that was given to me when I volunteered, they discovered I was a bit deaf. They looked up the regulations. And don't forget, the doctors were like me. They were volunteers. He wasn't a regular army man. And he couldn't find anything in the regulations about deafness. In fact, any regular army officer wouldn't have had me in the army. You see. So he put me down at A2. <laughs> he couldn't put me down at A1 because I was a bit deaf. You know, otherwise I was fit. And um, when I went to the Octu, 
you know I passed out quite well in the uh, theoretical side of things. They said I was too deaf. I shall go into the pay call, because I was a chartered accountant, you see. Just for the people who don't know, you was an officer's selection Officer's course, Cadet it? Training Unit. Yeah. Okay, so they put you in the pay call. No, they didn't. Mm -hmm. They said I should volunteer for the pay call, for a commission in the pay call, but they couldn't recommend me because the rules forbade an OCTU to recommend a man for commission in any other art unit. And uh, so I then uh, went back to a unit in Portsmouth, and when I got there, I applied for commission in the pay call. So they looked at my medical category, and it was far too high, they to get into the pay call. So they sent me to a, a hospital in Aldershot to get regraded. Well, again, they discovered that it was, they couldn't regrade me because of my deafness. So uh, although they found that my eyesight wasn't as good as it what should be, and they put the grading down, but I couldn't get a commission in the pay call because I was, wasn't unfit enough. And then I was sent to the Middle East. So I went out to the Middle East, around the Cape of Good Hope, as they all did those days, long sea journey, and was in the Western Desert, where I got... Uh, you were fighting, you were behind a gun, were you? Uh, no, not behind a gun. I was in a funny unit doing air photo interpretations. It was a start of air photo interpretation for the Army. The, the Air Force did its own photography for identifying targets to bomb, but there was nobody to take photographs of the forces on the ground to find out where the minefields were, where the artillery were, and so on. And it was started by us, and I was in this unit that was doing this job. But I got blown up by a bomb. It wasn't really badly hurt or anything, but it made me very deaf. So I decided I'd better go back to Cairo. So I went back to Cairo where the headquarters of my unit was, went to the hospital for had my ears seen to, and they did what they could. And the ear, nose and throat, ear, nose and throat surgeon The yes. ear, and throat surgeon asked my pay book. I gave my pay book and he said A2 or whatever it was and scribbled it up and put B5, you see. So I went back to the unit and applied for commission in the pay call. So I sent my application forward and then word came back from the... Um, <laughs> word came back from the war office they all applicating for commission in the pay call from the Middle East uh, to be uh, postponed for, till further notice. So uh, that was that. And then I was posted from Cairo to Baghdad. It's interesting war I had from the point of view of the places I went to. Because yeah. I went all the way from Cairo to Baghdad in the back of a truck or the front of a truck interesting journey. I went to Israel, of course. I had a holiday in Tel Aviv during, during the period bef between coming back to Cairo and being posted to bed dead. And I saw Tel Aviv in 1941, where it was an Arab city with a few Jews in it. It wasn't very nice. It wasn't a Jewish city then. Did you see much else of the country? Or just uh, the well, I remember going through Gaza, the Gaza Strip, and going down from Sinai into Israel, and Haifa, Mount Carmel, and Jaffa, where I spent my holiday in a boarding house that took troops in. <laughs> i never forget that. Five, five men in beds in a room big enough for about two, but never mind. Uh, then uh, went, to Baghdad. went to Baghdad, where I was taken seriously ill with osteomyelitis. I had uh, five months on my back from November till May. In hospital, 
in hospital in Baghdad and then down to Basra where the fighting is now then back from Basra to Baghdad when I got back to Baghdad my, I went to Baghdad because they were forming the Persia Iraq force Pi force P-A-I force it, because they were anticipating that Hitler would if he managed to get to Stalingrad would go through to India so they were getting a force here to try and stop him which would have been quite hopeless but never mind and uh, when I got back to Baghdad my unit had been disbanded but they weren't there so I hitchhiked literally hitchhiked my way back to Cairo from Baghdad which you could do in the army in those days Mind you, it was rather amusing because one of the hitch, one of the uh, cars that I found a lift from and contained a general, which was rather unusual, but he gave me a lift. <laughs> and uh, then I, when I got to Cairo, I was sent to a unit that was sailing from Alexandria to Tripoli to invade Italy. And uh, we were going over to Salerno. We weren't. We didn't know at the time that's where we were going. And uh, I went over to Salerno, where the fighting was very touch and go for a few days. By the time I went ashore, it was still pretty rough. And I got wounded by a splinter of a mortar that by a horrible mischance went into this leg. Yeah, which I'd already got the osteomyelitis, so I was evacuated to North Africa. I went back to England, and I met Bill. Right. Just for the word, your army career didn't have much religious um, connection, affiliation? You've None got. at all. The only thing that ever happened of any religious significance was during my time from going out to um, the Middle East, we spent some time in South Africa. And I can remember an occasion in the camp we were when a, a, a sergeant in charge of our platoon said, now it was a Sunday and there was going to be a church service. Uh, anybody who didn't want a church service can do uh, spud bashing, feeding spuds, you see. Anybody volunteering for spud bashing, so I stepped forward. And the sergeant said, what's the matter with you? I said, when I want to go to, I, when I go to church, I'll go before, because I want to, not because I'm bribed to, which you thought was a bit peculiar. The rest of the time, though, you usually you went to the church parades and you didn't... When there was a church parade, parade, we all had to go, and I went to church. Yeah. It didn't make any odds to me, it was no, just a bit of a bore. Yeah. Right. So you got back to England and you... May I met Bill, we 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 known each other, we... We, we found we liked each other. We married in the registrar's office because at the time I was nominally a Christian. I wasn't a Jew. And then when Leslie was either born or on her way, Bill said to me, uh, I won't be able to teach any child of ours the Christian religion. I don't know anything about it. Would you mind if our child is brought up Jew? I said, no, that's my me. In any event, before our child was born, I used to accompany Bill to St. John's Wood when she went to the High Holy Day service. I might have gone with her on a Sabbath service, I don't remember. But I can remember when I went to these services at St. John's Wood, they were, had a certain element of low church compared with, I'd been to Anglo-Catholic services in my time, when I was a child at home, but with a lot of uh, incense and all the rest of it, which I had been, had it been brought up, no church, didn't like. So when I went to St. John's Wood, there was no Hebrew to speak of. There was no uh, ceremony. The women and the men all sat together. I didn't realize how different it was from Orthodox. I didn't know anything about Orthodox Judaism. But when Leslie uh, was born, and we used to, I suddenly thought, well, you know, it seems a bit silly. I'm nominally a Christian, but don't go. And Bill's Jewish, bring her up. 
I think I'd better be, go and become a Jew. So I told Betty I wanted to be Jewish, and she was very pleased. By which time, my mother-in-law, who'd been living with us in the last few years, had, be, had died, which was a shame, because she would have been pleased too. And I went down to St. John's Wood, the synagogue. to the synagogue, and saw a rabbi there who said that uh, when I told him what I wanted to do, he said, was your mother Jewish? And I said, yes. He said, well, then you're a Jew, which I know now was wrong. Because the coins and liberals, your religion is that which you're brought up to be, not what your mother or father was. He was taking the Orthodox Jew. He was taking the Orthodox Jew because he'd been an Orthodox Jew. And in fact, the rabbi I saw used to take Billy out when she was about 18. Who was and that? What was his name? Cohen? No, what was it? Cohen. Ah, yes. Cohen. Yes. And he 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 left. The, he started off yes. as a Orthodox Jew. He became a liberal Jew yes. during the war because he met Rabbi Rayner. Then he was at St John's Wood. Right. Okay. Well, let's go back. So he said that you're Jewish. Yes. Well, right, but, but he gave me some books on liberal Judaism and told me to go away and read them, which I did. And when I read them and felt ready, I phoned them up. I went and saw him and they asked me questions, which I was able to presumably to answer satisfactorily because they gave me a certificate stating I was a Jew. <laughs> I was admitted to the Jewish religion. Then I went with Billy to St. John's Wood regularly. And uh, we joined the Young Marriage. I remember, which we enjoyed very much, so much so that we went on going to their function long after we were ceased to be young married, we were getting middle aged married, but we did we, we still went. And then uh, what job you come back so this was after the war, you got yourself a job here? Yeah, I got myself a job in the in the civil service as a professionally qualified accountant in the Ministry of Food. And uh, I was in, joined the civil service in 1946. I had a small period when I tried commerce with the chief accountant of Phoenix of Bond Street for about a year, but I didn't like it. And uh, I joined the civil service, and uh, strangely enough, I started my career in civil service working at Stanmore, Cannons Park. Anyway, I used to go with Billy to St. John's Wood uh, because we, we started off our life, as Billy told you, living in a flat in Hampstead, an unfurnished flat. And the reason we left there was because in 1957 or 1956, the government of the day, Conservative government actually, de-restricted rents in properties above a certain rateable value, although it wasn't in their manifesto at all. A lot of conservative people in the area were living in at these flats, very annoyed about it. And the rate, I knew the rent of those flats were going to increase significantly. In fact, it went up from uh, 300 a year to, uh, I think, 900 in two years. They went up very rapidly, and I decided to get out quickly. And I, we found a house in Hatch End, and I bought it. We moved into Hatch End, and then we joined Wembley, as I told you, which we weren't too happy with, were we? We weren't too happy at all. Wembley liberals. The Wembley liberals, and then we attended this meeting in the fog in November '63 or '4. I forget which year. The very first meeting, where there was such a thick fog that Bertram Jacobs couldn't get to it, I remember. Uh, I, Alan Lewis was there. The names of the people I remember being at the meeting were Alan Lewis, Charles and June Samuel, and uh, Dulcie Conradi, who she then was, and maybe her husband, and Sidney Britto, conducted it. But then he got knocked down outside St. John's Wood Synagogue. Yeah. Sidney Brick he was very badly hurt. 
And then there was another meeting held in Northwood, up uh, one of those halls near the Cottage Hospital, I think that's where it was, where it was agreed by a very narrow majority we should start. I've forgotten how many families, well, not more than about a dozen families agreed to start. And we had our very first meeting of those people who were interested in Alan Lewis's house. But he went round to people there and said, what do you do? You know, what's your job? And when I told him, I'll charge the gun, he said, you're treasurer. This is, you know, like the army, you know, can you drive, well, there's a wheelbarrow, take it away. And I was treasurer for about three or four years. And Alan Lewis was chairman. And it was great fun, and we watching it grow and struggling and whatever. And then, as you know, Alec Popper took over from Alan Lewis, and Alec Popper disappeared one day. And uh, we were, they were then at a bit of a quandary of what to do for a chairman. But Alan Lewis had already taken up far too much of his own time running the show. So no, he didn't want, and we didn't want for his sake and to, to go back to being chairman. And the only alternative to uh, Alan Lewis was me at that time. So I was became chairman. Bill had, had already started typing the newsletter for Michael Lever and uh, took over from Mike, when Michael Lever took, handed over to Bertram Jacobs, Billy went on typing for Bertram until Bertram gave up, and then Billy Allen gave up at the same time. So you were, you were involved in early decisions about taking Halliwell Road as the premises? Oh, yes. And Andrew Goldstein as a yes. student and then yes. permanent travel. Oh, uh, but uh, that, the Halliwell Road, taking over was done while Alan Lewis was chairman. But you were on the council. I was on the council again. and uh, we, we were very much concerned with the agreement with the council that um, John Hyman drew up very cleverly to enable us to be able to get our present premises. It hadn't been for that agreement. You know yeah, that. Indeed. Yes. You know about that. Yes. Yeah. And then uh, while I was chairman of the council, uh, and uh, Andrew Goldstein was sent as well, uh, Alan was chairman, Rabbi Fabulant with us. And then Rabbi Fabulant decided to go back to America, and then Andrew was joined us, probably while Andrew, while Alan was chairman, but he was a student at St. John's Wood while I was chairman. At St. John's Wood, at the College. At uh, Beck College. Yes. And then when uh, um, he was ordained. We had to make the decision whether we'd take on Andrew as our rabbi. And I can remember, t I think it was at annual general meeting or in council, I made the point that this doesn't do anything, it doesn't have any effect. Uh, I made the point, I don't know. Yeah. I made the point that it wasn't a matter of whether we could afford to have Andrew as our rabbi, whether we could afford not to have him. Because I come to the conclusion, which I still hold, that he's an extremely good first-class man, and I liked his wife Sharon very much. So uh, uh, when Andrew was appointed rabbi, we gave him all the support we could. And Michael Lever, who by that time had become treasurer, and I drew up the first contract of employment with Andrew, which uh, Michael and I uh, generally laid down the principles involved, and we gave it all to John Hyman to draw it up into a legal form. And that contract formed the model for all the contracts for all the rabbis in the liberal movement thereafter. I mean, something I'm very proud of. Yeah. And uh, it, it's all been improved since then, of course, things like sabbatical leave and 
the annual increments of rabbis, which now take place, that, those things didn't happen then. But one of the things I set my face against, which was discussed in council, is whether we should buy a house for the rabbi. And I said that would be very unfair because if we bought a house for him, the house would go up in value. He wouldn't gain anything from the value, and then when he wanted to move on, he wouldn't have it. So uh, we, what we should do is to lend him the money so that he could buy his own house and repay us at a reasonable rate or low rate of interest, which is what we did. So you can, after you served as um, chairman, you continued on council? I continued on council, as you know, uh, mainly concerned with covenants, which at the time when I was talking about, when we were much smaller than we were now, we had practically everybody, everybody's subscription covenant. But then we were small enough, I mean, it, it, those were the days when I could phone up anybody whose subscription was overdue and say to them, I would hate to have your name mentioned at the council meeting as being overdue. I'm sure you wouldn't want to. Or even to say at the, uh, on the annual, at the annual general meeting, to mention you as being in arrears would be very unfortunate. So, but there were a few, <laughs> there was a few enough members then for that to work. You can't do it today. But I went on until the, uh, uh, I decided I'd had enough. Yeah. Yeah. And then I've taken on various jobs, as you know, doing a metric rotor and various other things, until I got to the age and um, physical condition that I leave it to younger people to do. You retired from, you continued in the civil service until I retired, retired in 1975, after 30 years service. Roughly. Nothing very exciting in your civil service career today? Well, it was interesting. It, nothing exciting. I mean, I was concerned with certain things that got into the public eye because I worked for the Monopolies Commission mm -hmm. and uh, for the Restricted Practices Court. And uh, I was interested in it. One of the strange coincidences is one of the people with whom I became very friendly uh, when. Uh, I the council when I we started with Bertram Jacobs. Bertram Jacobs, as you remember, was a leading member of the carpet trade. And I was concerned with the price agreement that the carpet manufacturers have between each other to charge a fixed price. Everybody charged the same price for their carpet. The coincidence was that uh, I was on this case against the carpet manufacturers. Bertram was a carpet manufacturer and was working in, to try and defend the case. And uh, I discovered, uh, I remember going down to where but to Bertram's company, where they were in Southampton, and seeing that one of the directors lived in Hatch End, and wondering who it was, because I knew the name, I didn't know the name then, this was before the synagogue was formed, you see. I mean, no, this was in about 1960, 61, you see. And uh, it wasn't until long afterwards that we discovered that we were on the opposite yeah. side. Strange coincidence. Yes. Yeah. Other than that, the only thing that um, your people, who, when you write this, might be interested in, that after all those years of uh, I told you at the beginning that my grandfather saw the last three men hanged in Newgate. I spent the last years of my civil service career working in Old Bailey, where the three men were hanged. Um, it's called, what happened, the family firm of Harris, you obviously lost any um, direct connection Oh, with. long ago, yes. You don't get any dividends or anything? No, 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 never did. But the extraordinary thing about my, any connection with my grandfather, I told you, was selling dolls. And during the course of his journeys around, met a man called Marx. 
I've forgotten where it was. All I can remember, my grandfather telling me that he met Marx and he asked my grandfather if he'd like to buy out his partner, a man called Spencer, because Spencer was drinking too much. And my grandfather said he was very sorry, but his own business was giving him as much as he could manage. So it could have been... His partner too? Yes. Well, They're one of those things. Your grandfather was travelling around the country. Oh, you're travelling around, you see. When his wife, uh, who then organised the manufacturing side, and uh, the house where I was born was where my grandfather was living at that time, and then behind the house in Kentish Town, this was in the road off the Kentish Town Road, there was a mews. And they had built, but it was already built, or my grandfather had it built, a small factory. Where my grandfather was, grandmother was in charge of the manufacturing, my grandfather did the selling. Right. So, um, right. To add which yes. I think is something which I'd like to say. Yes. Since 1964, that's 23 years, and the the synagogue has existed. Also it has formed a very great part of our lives. Uh, yes. And we've always felt very close to the synagogue. We're very close indeed to Andrew and Sharon. And it has been as probably as I can only think of a few people who who have been as close to the synagogue as us, a Alan and Joan in particular. You know, we very, very feel very much about the sort of formed a big part in your life. Yes. yes. Right. Well, that's it. Thank you. I just give you the copyright point that oh, you yes, agree that, that copyright to the project, yes. and there's nothing in this which you would want to keep confidential. No. Thank you. Um, Phil, you've just shown me I a was just showing you that which has yourself. got a monogram A R. A -R that's Abram Rothschild. It was at their wedding, then, my great grandparents. Right. And they've come down to me. Date 1843. 1843. And you have a set of 12 of these I've got same. a set of 12 of those. And that's when they were in They're Frankfurt German silver. Me. German silver, which they bought over from, from Frankfurt. Germany. Yes. They've, they've come, come down to me. From your and they're so modern in appearance. Isn't that strange? They've come down from your. From your which from my great grandparents on my father's side. No, to this. There's also silver from Bill's mother's de Mesa yes. family, um, including a what is this? A fish a slice. It's a fish and slice. Fish slice and, and it works remarkably well. And so. a soup ladle. And these oh, got a lot of this These one. are English hallmark silver, and they date back to the. Well, this is a Georgian piece. You can see this jo the Georgian's head on that. Wait a minute, I can get the, I can, I've even got in You've my got shows, I've got the form all the dates. Right, the dates. But the point is that they go back to your, to Bill's to family. My, with to my mother's mother's family. To the Demisa the, the mother's, which was what surname? Uh, Demisa. No, no. Her, that was her maiden name, but I don't know her mother's maiden don't name. Know. But they were both sides of the Demesas were in England since uh, almost well, for a long no, time. No, my mother's mother's side, she'd always said we're here from the town of Cromwell when Cromwell. they were first. But my mother's father's people must have come over in the early, uh, in the very early uh, 18th century. century. So both sides are fairly long standing yes. English. Um, much earlier than the usual wave of immigration from the 1850s well, period. So did you feel that you were something of aristocratic? Well, the strange image? things I didn't, but other people mm -hmm. behaved as though we were, which I thought was very odd. Well, mm -hmm. it is a little yes. distinguished and unusual. Yes, and to I, I, I just couldn't make this out at all. But I... Uh, and I was very surprised when I heard about other people coming across anti-Semitism because we never did. Did you yourself? Okay, not much. But no. your this your mother's family they lived in London, did they all yes, as long as you yes, know? Yes. Is it traced?
back and document it, particularly to the... We don't know. Oh, Leslie would so love to know. I've got, I have got photos of them with pipe, uh, uh, top hats, you know, the tall got top hats. And, this can and over there I've got tin photographs. The silver soup ladle, in fact, is 18... Um, o three and the um, another the fish slice 1802 and there's also a silver and ivory toddy ladle which is French from about 1790 and a silver uh, berry spoon of London of 1777 which is the earliest which has been dated that, um, there's a Jewish chronicle entry of 18th of January 1878 um, relating to Bill's, uh, Lillian's um, mother's family, um, saying on the births on the um, 13th January at 16 Norfolk Road, Dalston East, East the wife of Simeon, S I M E O N, yes, de Meitzer, M E Z A, of a daughter. What? Uh, namely, um, the daughter was Lillian's mother, Miriam. Lillian also has a prayer book, um, which is of the written in German and published in Frankfurt in 1851. It's got Hebrew, of course, in it um, as well, but it's yes, written in German. German and Hebrew, which has at the back something of a the family details, namely um, Hugo Aufholz, um, born 3rd October 1838, and Sarah um, Aufholz, um, born Rothschild. Um, born 6th July 1847 and um, they were because the elder son was 69 they were 69. married in 1868 and the date given earlier on this tape namely of the marriage in error. 1843 is in error um, under this are listed the names of their nine children including the third child Carl on 30th December 1872 who was Lillian's grandfather, Ma no, oh. her father, Lillian's father, um, and of these, and it lists, yes, the rest of the family, down to the youngest, born in December 1882. I have On the tape. As regards old photographs, Bill has a Daguerre type, an I've early photograph, here, I don't know who it is. on metal, of Hugo um, Alfholtz, my grandfather, her grandfather and a picture of the yes, Demisa family in late Victorian no time and some of the how many of the of about seven of the 16 children of the Demisa family there's a picture of um, Bill of uh, Bill's mother in an early open car uh, somewhere in some rather mountainous country I think area it goes like, uh, probably the seat of the north, north country of Scotland. There's another tin daguerreotype showing the demisas um, apparent on the grass, apparently on the country or seaside, or perhaps. Or the sea or something. Um, and there's one of the Rothschild grandmother yes. um, holding her eldest, eldest son, son, a small early photo, namely Zara um, Rothschild, or who married Alfons, holding Carl. And also an early photo of Rachel de Misa, um, Lillian's mother's mother, um, taken in London, a photographer in the poultry, with her hair down in straight uh, ringlets. She must say, have been young then, it must when have she been was quite marriage. young. The Jewish Encyclopedia has details of three de Misas who were Danish but related to the English branch of the family. Yes. Yeah.